Poland's Jerzy Kukuczka was a legendary alpine-style climber who would become the second person ever to summit all 14 8,000er peaks. However, in 1989, Jerzy would find himself on the unclimbed south face of Lotse, hanging by a single rope with only 250 meters left to go before reaching the summit. This is his story. Jerzy Kokotska was widely considered one of the greatest high altitude climbers in history, and it's not really up for debate. He was born in Katowice, Poland in 1948 and discovered rock climbing at the age of 17 when a friend invited him to tag along to climb a small limestone wall. As soon as the young Kokotska was on the wall, he knew climbing would have a big impact on his life and between the ages of 17 to 19, it would be his entire focus. Through hard work and a little bit of natural talent, Jerzy quickly became a strong rock climber. But it wasn't until Jerzy joined the Katowice Mountaineering Club in 1966, where his mountaineering career really took off. It was in this club that Jerzy wound up finding future climbing partners and being introduced to the Tatras Mountains, where he would really begin to develop his alpine style of climbing that he was famous for. This style was popular during the time period and is highly regarded as the purest form of mountaineering. Instead of hauling loads of gear up the mountain with the intention of longer periods of stay, one would ascend and descend as fast as their body could take them. For the next five years, Jerzy was either going to trade school or practicing his skills. He did not have any money, so the only way for Jerzy to venture outside of Poland was to raise capital either through manual labor or shady business practices. And using his talents the only way he knew how, he found work as an industrial climber. Despite his monetary struggles, it was clear that Jerzy had a natural talent for mountaineering, as each year he progressively accomplished more difficult routes on the Tatras Mountains. But it really was in 1971 and 1972 when Jerzy climbed two of the hardest and longest routes on the range, and the winner, I might add, that his name really became known in Poland. I won't go into too much detail on his accomplishments before the 8000ers, but between 1971 and 1979, Jerzy would go on to make a name for himself abroad, with successful summits on the Dolomites in Italy, to climbing Mont Blanc four times in one trip, to conquering Mount Denali in Alaska, and even climbing a new route on the Grandes Jorises during his honeymoon. Jerzy continued to develop his skills, most notably though, he had a real knack for being comfortable in colder climates, which would translate to many different winter summits in his career. In fact, he would become so good at climbing in the winter that he was invited to join a select Polish climbing group called the Ice Warriors. They were a small group of climbers that were the best that Poland had to offer with the goal of making a name for themselves. The group specialized in winter summits, but also uncovering new routes which Jerzy discovered that he loved. The challenge of climbing something that has never been done before appealed to him, and unsurprisingly, he would become one of the best in the world at it. Anytime he approached an expedition, he would always consider if a new route could be taken to reach the summit. This would be really noticeable in the latter half of his climbing career, where his main focus was to summit all 14 8000ers. Jerzy would spend 1979 through 1988 tackling the tallest mountains in the world. He would spend months at a time in different countries, just to fly back to Poland to raise funds, and do it all over again. Because of the monetary struggles, Jerzy had to be creative and managed to cut costs by crafting his own climbing equipment, something that many people have indifferent opinions on, but I'll let you come to your own conclusions on that fact. Nevertheless, the next 10 years, Jerzy was on top of the world, quite literally. He would end up successfully summiting all 8,000 or peaks in just under 7 years, which I might add was a world record for the shortest time to summit all of the mountains until it was broken in 2014. But what really separated Jerzy from everyone else was not necessarily what he did, but how he did it. Not only did he successfully reach the summit, but he established new routes on 10 of the 14 8000 or peaks, a record that still stands today and will probably never be broken. Just to add to the craziness, four of these summits were done in the middle of winter, and among those four, three of them, Dalagiri, Kenchenjunga, and Annapurna 1, would be the first time anyone had reached the summit during the winter. 
But perhaps the most impressive feat that he accomplished was his summit of the unclimbed south face of K2. Yerge, along with a fellow alpine mountaineer, Tadeusz Piotrowski, managed to establish a new route on K2 in 1986. The south face is littered with giant seracs, and easily the most avalanche prone section on the mountain. In fact, it is so dangerous that it has been called suicidal by many, and thus, there has never been another attempt. Let me say this again, there has never been another attempt. Yerge himself described the climb as the most difficult in his career, and finding a new route on K2 catapulted his climbing status to being one of the greatest of all time. However, the accomplishments was dampened when Yerge's climbing partner, Piotrowski, lost his crampons while descending and fell to his death. Overall, the 1986 K2 season was brutal, as there were 13 deaths total, so Yerge did not receive much recognition at first, but was later recognized for the accomplishment. There is simply no denying everything that he did, as there is a reason he is considered one of the greatest climbers of all time. But even a man so proficient on high altitude climbs will still face danger. After Yerge accomplished something never done before, reached the peaks of the 14 tallest mountains in the world, fought through the cold of winter, and established new routes in some of the most hospitable places on our planet, he still wanted more. He took a look back at his career and set his sights on the very first 8,000er peak he summited back in 1979, Lotse. During the time, he followed the conventional west face route, so it was nothing to diminish, but to a man like Yerge, the normal route was just not enough. It was decided that he would revisit the peak, but this time attempting to climb from the most difficult section, the south face. The south face of Lotse is a staggering wall of sheer verticality that towers over the trek to the Everest base camp. Many climbers at the time said one of the greatest alpine walls in the world is impossible, and that is exactly why Yerge wanted to take on the challenge. While others claim it is the final major Himalayan difficult climb lift in the time period, I want to give some perspective here and state that the south face consists of a vertical rock wall with ice that stretches for 3,300 meters during the climb. The wall is considered one of the hardest yet greatest vertical climbs in the world. It towers over the Everest base camp, intimidating even the best. Any type of mistake that is made is magnified, and being on that wall when bad weather rolls in means certain death. After working for a few months in Poland, Jerzy would gather enough funds for his attempt. A climber by the name of Rizard Polowski would join him as they planned for an alpine-style climb. The pair would travel to Kathmandu in the summer of 1989, where they stocked up on additional climbing equipment. The markets there were accustomed to mountaineers, so they had plenty of supplies, but most of the town was poor, so it was common that second-hand equipment was sold, which is a dangerous realization as alpinists relied on their gear, and if something was defective, such as a rope or crampons, it could be disastrous. Once Yerge and Polowski were satisfied with their gear, they trekked to Everest's base camp, which stood just below the south wall of Lotse. Unfortunately, during their journey, weather was an issue, and they certainly would not attempt the climb if an opportunity did not present itself. So they waited, and waited, and waited some more. All the pair needed was a couple of days, and finally in October, after a few months had passed, the weather finally began to give them an opportunity, and on October 23rd, they started their climb. Yerge and Polowski flew up the mountain, making incredible progress. Those below were lucky to watch such elite climbers perform their art as the duo would finish the first day on the mountain uneventful. They set up a bivouac around 8,200 meters, only 300 meters away from the summit. Like most summit attempts, the morning before the final push starts early, and most times before the sun rises to give climbers enough time to reach the top, and make their way back down to safety. This climb was no different, as Yerge and Polowski started preparing for the push well before they could see a ray of sunlight. They quickly ate and began the final push, which consisted of a blank slab of rock that did not have support from below. One wrong move, and you are free falling for over 2,000 meters. Yerge took point, but they quickly realized that there was a problem. The single main rope that they had been using up until this point was jammed from below, and there was no way that they would be able to utilize it for the upcoming climb. Instead, Yerge pulled out a transport rope that he bought at the Kathmandu market. 
The rock was treacherous, and it was clear from the jump that this is by far the most difficult area of the mountain. It was shortly after they started climbing the rock face when Yerge took a fatal step and slipped, almost instantly starting to tumble down the mountain. The transport rope attached to Yerge was his last hope, but it snapped under his weight, plunging him down the mountain to his death. Poloski could do nothing but sit there in shock over what just happened. It took a minute to process everything, and then came the fear for his own life. He was not as strong of a climber as Yerche, and not only did he just witness his friend fall to his death, but he was also still on this unclimbed, deadly rock. Poloski had years of experience and would need every ounce of it, but he did manage to reach camp safely that night. The news was delivered and the community wept for losing such a great climber, but an even greater man. Yerche would leave behind a wife and two children. One of them, his son, would follow in his footsteps and later summit Everest. This death was a challenging one for me, as I would think such a great climber would have a good understanding of his equipment, but I was not on that mountain, so I don't deserve to judge what happened. I just hope this story reminds us of how precious life can be and how great of a climber Yerzhe Kukutska truly was.